Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm just uh, doing the final bits of moderation here and inviting our final speaker to join us on stage. He's already in the room, so uh, we'll be starting in a second. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first Startup Spaces event hosted by Circle CI and based on the Building Tech Teams report created in partnership with Sifted. Uh, you can download the report by clicking on the pinned tweet that should be above the speakers in this room. Uh, and if it's not showing up yet, uh, it should appear shortly. Uh, in today's session, we'll discuss the key challenges at each stage of the startup journey from seed to series C and beyond and how to overcome them. And we have a wonderful group of guest speakers who will share their extensive knowledge on this topic with us today. We will have time for questions at the end. So if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand using the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. It's the little heart with a plus sign. Uh, and there's a hand raise option there. Alternatively, you can use the Circle CI Spaces hashtag. So hashtag Circle CI Spaces. It's on the title of the room. So you can just click on that. Uh, and you can send us questions that way. And we'll ask them uh, at, on your behalf at the end. Um, and before we start properly, uh, a few housekeeping items. This session will be recorded for uh, podcasts, so please be aware that if you come up on stage, you are agreeing to being recorded. And this event is going to run for an hour with a hard stop at 1 p.m. UK time, 2 p.m. Central European time. Uh, with that, let's welcome our speakers. So first, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Ed to introduce himself. Ed Lascelles is a partner at Albion VC, uh, and he will be uh, adding his expertise on all things investment and funding to our conversation. Ed, over to you. Uh, uh, thanks, Nicole. Yeah, so I, I, as you mentioned, I'm a uh, partner at Albion. Um, I lead our sort of um, tech investing here. Um, we've been around for 25 years. We've invested in 200 companies. We've got almost a billion dollars that we invest in early stage companies um, focused, focused on the UK and in particular in sort of software and healthcare. Great. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, next, we have uh, Luca Grullo who is Grula, apologies for that, who is the CTO at Signal uh, and uh, is at Signal AI, and uh, he'll be adding his technical and startup expertise to the conversation. Over to you, Luca. Hi, Nicole, thanks for that. Yeah, um, I'm Luca Grula, I'm the Chief Technologist Officer at Signal AI, and I've been working the startup scale out for the last 10, 12 years. In particular with Signal, I've you know, been going from, from the seed round to the later C, raising over 50, 60 million over the, along the way and expanding to, to the US and launching new product on the market. So very keen to share some of the experience and how to think about product technology uh, when you look for funding and also while you're looking for hyper growth and scale. Amazing. Thank you very much, Luca. And finally, we are joined by Nico Vierhut, uh, and apologies if I said your name incorrectly, uh, who is uh, uh, part of the Circle CI team and is also going to share his extensive expertise with us. Uh, Nico, over to you. Thank you very much. Well, the pronunciation was okay. So uh, can't, uh, can't hold it against you, you that you're not Dutch. <laughs> so, all right. Hey, um, I am, uh, yeah, I've been co-founding a few companies. I've uh, been previously the CEO of Vem.io, which was recently taken over um, by Circus CI. And of course, I've been mentor and coach with a few um, uh, startup uh, like Startup Bootcamp, Techstars. Uh, I've been uh, running some seed and early stage rounds in terms of funding as a CEO, as well as my Series A. So uh, I hope to share a bit of this uh, these insights with you uh, you all today. Great. Thank you very much, Nico, for that. Um, to get us started, I'm just going to uh, go through the different uh, phases of a startup, uh, because obviously we'll be using terms such as seed, series B, uh, whatnot. So uh, I think it's important that everyone is on the same page when it comes to definitions. So uh, we start at seed, and the seed round usually happens when the company is at the initial idea uh, stage, or once the founder has a prototype or proof of concept, as well as some kind of sign that there's a demand for what could be offered. 
Uh, once the, the company has developed a bit of a track record, uh, it goes on to series A. Um, that can be either an established user base or consistent revenue figures or some other key performance indicator. Um, that company may opt for series A funding in order to further optimize its user base and product offerings. Uh, series B rounds are all about taking businesses to the next level, past the development stage, and Series B funding is used to grow the company so that it, will, it can meet those levels of demand. And finally, Series C is uh, when businesses uh, that make it to these funding sessions are already quite successful. These companies look for additional funding in order to help them develop new products or explore new markets and even acquire other companies. Uh, so that's a brief intro from me and you probably won't be hearing much else from me other than asking some questions. Um, but to start us off, uh, I think it'd be good to discuss some best practices. Uh, so let's say you are uh, setting up a startup. Uh, what do you think, and this is obviously for all the guests, but I'll kind of prompt you. Uh, what do you think is the key skill set that you need to have at the start of the process of setting up a startup? Let's start with you, Luca. Oh, it's a great question. I think there are a number of uh, number of skills that you need. You definitely need to have a, a vision. You need to have a person or multiple people that have the ability to see an opportunity uh, out in the market uh, that is not being taken yet. Uh, so that that is a skill by itself. This is not easy to find. This is mostly where the founder, you know, is the one that has this idea, and uh, together with their other co-founders. I think the other elements you need is you need to have. Uh, you find uh, your funding team has to have re resilience. If they really want to go to the goal. It's going to be a, a, a bumpy road. There's going to be a lot of turn and twist. There's going to be a lot of learning so that resilience will be good. And the third characteristic, you want to be complement to each other. Right? You want to have the skills that all together the people around the table will allow to go to the that stage of validation. So it's the vision. Is that some business acumen, you know, to be able to start thinking how to commercialize the product. And you definitely need, in my opinion, a product technology person that is help, start helping think how technology can solve this problem and start thinking how to get there over time. Absolutely. Thank you for that, uh, Luca. Uh, Nico, uh, I'm sure you have something to add to that list. Yeah. So uh, let's start with stamina. I think... Uh... <laughs> That's probably the most important skill. Um, and uh, next to that, uh, I wanted to uh, put uh, the sales capability uh, in the spotlight here. And now I'm specifically talking about the storytelling, about what it is that you do, um, why you do it, and how you do it. Uh, by the way, I have a little tip for, uh, for uh, everyone on this uh, call. So I took the book, The Story Brand, from Donald Miller. And I took that to heart. And that's also how I built basically uh, this story. And this is how I started the process. Um, and just in a nutshell, this is about uh, Kung Fu Panda and Master Chifu. So this is about we are here as a company to make our customers a hero. Yeah, that's that's in short what this this is all about. So this is uh, this is I think uh, what's what's key in this. Uh, in the start of the process uh, and then focus on the pain on the table and the business problem and why your team is best positioned to solve this problem and why you can be the guide and why you're per personally motivated uh, to do this. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Nico. Um, Ed, I don't know if you have anything to add at this stage, but if you do, just unmute. Uh, if not, uh, we can move on uh, to the next question, but go ahead. I was just going to add, I guess, you know, not as a founder myself, but as a, an investor in founders, um, I just highlight that sort of vision and storytelling point, um, because that that's, that narrative is what sort of binds everyone together, be it the employees, the customers, um, and then your investors. And as you build your stakeholder group, you need an alignment. Uh, and that comes from um, uh, comes from the founder who tells a story and sets out that vision. Being able to do that clearly and effectively is something that you see all the great uh, leaders um, develop, um, you know, very successfully over their career. Thank you very much for that, Ed. Um, the next point we wanted to bring up is 
when do you start looking for investment? At which point in the company's life cycle do you actually go out uh, to speak to someone for investment? Ed, let's start with you. When would you like uh, prospective founders to come to you for investment? Uh, so, so, I mean, it obviously depends on stage. So we're quite focused on Series A. Um, uh, and, and I think it does probably vary um, a, li a little bit between the stages. Um, the other thing that's happening is that the funding market is, <laughs> is so dynamic. And it's moving so fast and changing so quickly. I think, you know, well, however I answer it now, it's different to what I would have said six months ago, probably different to the next six months. Um, uh, but the... Um, uh, pro probably a couple of things I would say uh, that, that worth we're focusing on. So the first is um, you're kind of always fundraising, um, and um, particularly again in this market where you, you can sort of raise money very quickly. And um, you know, I guess what historically you might have seen as three year cycles between each series. You're now seeing some companies, you know, a year or even less. Um, and we as investors really like investing in teams and people that we've got got to know. Um, and what sort of hate is someone comes in and goes, right, um, here's, here's who I am. This is what I'm doing. Here's a company. This is amazing. Um, we're just being loads of investors right now. We're expecting term sheets in two weeks. And suddenly I've got to get to know, you know, the person, the team, the business, the opportunity inside out uh, and sort of consummate the marriage in, in a, a matter of weeks. It's just, I mean, it happens, but it's hard. And I, I just wonder if that's optimal because because it is kind of like a marriage. I mean, you know, the, the companies we invest in, we're typically involved with for seven, seven years, even longer. Like you don't want to make a mistake in either direction. You know, founders don't want investors on their board who are difficult or don't understand the business or don't add any value um, and vice versa. So um, so I think having long-term relationships um, is very helpful. So always, always keeping um, warm, I guess, uh, you know, the, the relationships you can um, is the first thing um but that all said i think when you when people go to market they should do so very intentionally because you only kind of get one shot so you have this warm relationship and then you go out and you go fundraising um someone will look at it very closely and then they'll say yes or no but if they said no that that's probably that's probably a no forever very rarely is it no but if you do these things then then it will be a yes i mean that does happen but um I think you kind of get one serious look um, from potential investors and everyone's a bit idiosyncratic. Um, so it's quite difficult to tell how it's going to go. But if you think that through, you just want to make sure your story and all your information and what, you know, what you're putting forward is as good as it can be before you go and do that. Thank you very much, Ed. Nico, I've noticed you unmuted, so I'm sure you have something to add. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I actually have a slightly... Uh conflicting message to add, sorry, Ed. Um, so as a CEO or as a fundraiser, uh, you're very easily trapped into uh, the big trap of uh, talking to uh, VCs pretty much all the time um, and not, not yielding a lot of results. So I would argue you're always fundraising. And of course, I agree with Ed that um, the VCs that, that you've been targeting and you want uh, to invest in your business, you need to keep a relation uh, with, and, and that's not just six months. So that's a longer term relationship. But before you know, and that's a big trap, is uh, you're just spending your time on, on doing this, uh, doing pitches and, and spending a lot of time with the junior analyst uh, at VCs, uh, grilling your business and not, not getting any results. So you really have to uh, time box uh, as a manager your time you're spending on this. Um, so, uh, <laughs> sorry, Ed. <laughs> no, I, I, I actually would agree with you completely. I, it, I mean, I think there's sort of how you raise funding is probably, you know, a whole session on its own uh, and probably multiple sessions for each little, little bit of it. But um, uh, I would agree. Yeah, you want to develop relationships, but with only a few who you really like. Um, you're, you're quite right. I mean, if you're not careful, you can, you can be speaking to junior people in funds that are never going to invest in you. And they're just, yeah, they're just a time suck. Violently agree that. Yeah. <laughs> 
I think one of the biggest challenges for founders in any sector is uh, managing time correctly and I guess speaking to the right people and focusing your energies there is always going to be one of those uh, important decisions to make um, from what we are discussing here. Uh, Luca, your thoughts on this particular topic? I think that Ed and Nico covered very well the, 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 the scenario of when it's time to go out. The only thing that I want to add is like naturally um, you you want to be very deliberate, as that said, to go out in the market. And in order to do that, you also have to be quite clear in your mind which KPIs you need to have to go out in the market and, and, and have an impact. And that started even earlier than deciding when it's time to go out to the market, right? So you need to start thinking which KPIs I want really to, to optimize over the next cycle. So in X month, I go out in the market to raise the money. And that is because this is one of the things that will, you know, based on which time of run you go after, people will ask for. And some of these uh, metrics need time to adjust. Not every, not every single metric will skyrocket overnight. So this is something to keep in mind in your um, mental model of how, when and how to go out to, to raise money. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Luca. Um, so... Kind of along the same lines, but moving a little bit from the when to look for investment, uh, where to look for investment, I guess, is the other big question. We have, of course, VCs, but are there other options? Where should uh, potential founders or uh, funder, uh, uh, lookers, fund lookers uh, be searching for these investments? Uh, Luca, let's start with you. Oh, that's a great question, but I actually think that Nico and Ed are much more be better positioned than me. I think that definitely if, if VC is, it's, it's, it's a path, you know, it's going out to create those relationships. Early stage, of course, you can go for, there are a number of accelerator and angel investment that will give you a starting point, but this is not going to go beyond the, the early stage, early seed uh, level. So after that, I think it's about creating the relation with VCs and expanding that. Thank you, Luca. Uh, Nico, uh, your views? Yeah, um, for me, VC is definitely one path, but then there's different categories of VCs as well. Say smart VCs that have a great network and are investing in your industry, for example. Um, then there's a big difference between European mainland VCs, UK VCs versus Silicon Valley VCs. So uh, you'd also have to kind of take a view on how aggressive you want the boardroom to be, i.e. the most aggressive is the Silicon Valley-based VCs. Um, but I, also from a different angle, uh, I think it's it's most valuable to first start, if you can, um, with buying time. Uh, if you're not ready, talking about these KPIs, I, 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 that's truly how it is. If you think it's too early to raise and you never get a second chance to get a first impression, you, you're you probably better turning to, for example, gov government governmental grants, uh, as well as in certain cases, business angels, um, to basically buy yourself time to to basically hit the KPIs and, and find the proof. Um, and, and that ultimately is going to save you a lot of equity that you have to put on the table. Uh, or can get you more money for the same equity, uh, for, for that matter. Yeah. Thank you, Nico. A good advice there, Ed. Yeah, I also well, I, I always think like the best best form of finance is customer cash, like for sure. Um, so the most expensive money you can get is is you know giving away your equity. You've only got so much of it, and you know you give it away away very 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 carefully. And there are lots of other ways you can raise money before you get to giving away equity uh, I say cu customer cash is, is just the best and it's um, uh, you know we sometimes see companies come in and they've just been living off um, investors the whole time and sometimes that's a necessity you know um, for that particular company in those circumstances but sometimes it's like a culture of sort of rather than kind of just doing whatever it takes to kind of make ends meet we'll, we'll just go to some investors and ask them to put more money into the company and and it's just, yeah, it's the most expensive way of funding a company. And I mean, other sources, apart from obviously customer cash, um, yeah, government grants, um, uh, sometimes debt is appropriate. I mean, it sort of, it sort of depends. Um, just, you know, go, going down the VC path is, is a very specific 
way of financing a company. It's sort of saying, in, I mean, it, you know, I think you're quite right, um, Nico, to sort of highlight the difference between the different VCs, but the Silicon Valley model of just going for billion dollar outcomes or or go home is, is sort of spreading everywhere now. And I think, I mean, it's it's a pretty similar mantra. I think we're hearing for almost everyone we co invest with these days. And so, and it, and it's sort of, it works for us and our investors because actually companies can scale to be absolutely massive very quickly and, and generate amazing returns for those people involved. But you can still be an amazing company even if you don't become a billion dollars in value within the next five years. Um, I mean, A, you can be that valuable over a much longer time period or you could just build a great company that you own 100% of um, that goes and does some amazing things in you know your industry for your customers. You know, Employees have a great time, wonderful business. But that's not the sort of company that a vc is going to back well it may be but it depends i mean you know we're looking for three four five times you know annual growth in the early phases ridiculous pace of hiring product shipping you know super dynamic markets and like you know that that's that's one approach not the only way to grow a business it if you do want to grow that business then then you do want to go and raise venture capital because you need to get funded appropriately and to, to the extent of what is ed is just saying it is like the moment you decide to go to the VC path, you know that you you make a clear decision. You need to go on that path for a couple of iterations because the expect, expectation of growth has had highlighted are quite high. So the decision is also really also when it's time to to go on to that path because at the point is not there's no absolute no turning back. But for a while that is your growth trajectory and you have to achieve those growth uh, target that naturally you, is coming through the investment that you're receiving. Yeah, I'd, I'd great points there, Nico. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I'd love to put a perspective from a VC on on this one. So, I made a comment about the differences in VCs and 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 then grossly uh, the difference between US or Silicon Valley based and uh, say European mainland. The key thing founders need to realize is that um, the VCs are there to basically place bets. Yeah. So they take 10 investments in one co in companies and out of that, one of them is going to be successful and time is ticking. So for them, uh, yeah, time, time is an enemy in that sense. So they want to know as quickly as possible. And even if they have to invest twice the amount of money, if they would know that your company is either going to be successful or it's going to die, um, it's going to be worth a bet. And that's very different from a founder's perspective. So finding the VC that fits your risk profile, i.e. that's going to say, okay, you know what? You're going to get not 12 months in time, but you're going to get 18 or 24 months time to basically hit these milestones. And no, I don't want you to crazily hire people in the US and kind of uh, start big sales efforts because we know your product is not ready. We first need to do a few things first. Is very, very important. And I'm not saying one is worse than the other, but it's important to find the right VC that's willing to share this uh, journey with you and that's uh, that's tailored to you and of course sometimes you don't have a choice and you're with your back against the wall so you don't, you don't have any choice and you'll take any money uh, but if you have a choice uh, and you should if you've started this early enough you should uh, pay attention to this Thank you very much. Um, one final question at this stage, which is uh, probably best placed for Ed, but obviously everyone can have an opinion on this. How is the best way to get in touch with a VC? Uh, is cold outreach best? Uh, how, what should they bring to the table when approaching you? So uh, like definitely the best way is, is via networks. Um, so um, if you can get referred into someone, that, that's just... 10 times better and more effective. I worry a bit about it as, as we, I think everyone is grappling with um, the sort of diversity problem in terms of the um, spread of founders that we back. And I do wonder if, um, if the fact that networks are so, and referrals are so effective as a way in kind of leaves that as a problem. And so I'm sort of at the moment don't have as clear an answer to this as, as I used to, because I think I would have just said referrals, but, um, I think we, you know, we need to have um, uh, more uh, openness to just, you know, people coming out of the blue. It's just there is a kind of overwhelming number of um, ways, you know, like 
the number of LinkedIn messages and emails and you know uh, tweets, whatever it is. It's just, um, uh, but it, but it works. I mean, I, I anyway. I would guess probably the best thing if you can't get a referral. I mean, referrals are the best. If you can't get a referral. I think just a really well crafted one or two sentences, not a in whatever form of communication, because you do sometimes read something like that's just really clever. Well, that's a great idea. Well, that's that's perfect for for what we like to invest in. You know, that's really thoughtful. Um, so may, if you are going cold, I would think have a look carefully who who you know which, which fund you want as an investor. Um, which um, which partner uh, is the right partner? What do they like? What do they invest in? What's interesting them? And then just sort of you know craft the craft the message appropriately. All of that makes sense, uh, Nico and Luca. Uh, any builds on that? Hundred percent agree. Yeah, hundred percent. There you go. That was an easy one. Um, so when we start talking about Series A, um, how since that is your um, area of expertise, Ed, uh, how do you raise the first round and what should a company, a startup be sharing with you as a VC uh, when presenting their case? Um, so, I mean, you know, the normal, I think the normal process is so, so you, you get an intro, however, however that happens. Uh, there's often like a first pitch um uh, in the old days that would be face to face you know probably an hour these days it's often like a half hour zoom um but it's that's the kind of that's you know often just setting out that vision that narrative i was talking about at the beginning um uh, and then you know just the, the highlights across the business a, a few and and then i guess from my side uh, and you know the investor side you're sort of you just sense checking that does the whole thing make sense and you know do, do i think that this is the right team for for us you know we're going to work well together they're going to be good leaders for the business. Um, and then if that goes, and there's so, you know, normally a short deck, I mean, short is good, not, not too long. And then if that sort of goes well, then you kind of dive into reviews on, you know, product market team finances, metrics, that sort of thing. Um, and that's maybe a sort of couple of weeks, um, two, three weeks, um, depends how, how well understood the market is. Um, and then hopefully you get term sheets. Um, but it's often just that first, you know, that first sort of pitch, half an hour to an hour is kind of, is kind of the big one. Uh, I should say it's probably often, I think most funds also have a partner presentation at the end, which is actually a sort of the same thing, but just done to a wider audience. So really spending time on like, um, well, maybe another way of putting it is it, our companies that we've invested in, when they go to raise at the next stage, we always tell them to, before they write a deck, just to write down um, their story on one page. Like, you know, why do they exist? What, are the, what problem are they solving? How big a problem is it? Um, uh, you know, why are they winning? Um, what, what traction have they got? But uh, what evidence have they got of the, of the winning, which is a sort of clue to traction? But it, write that down on one page, turn into a deck, have it presented very clearly in half an hour, uh, and that kind of kicks everything off. Brilliant. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Luca, any builds on that? Uh, I think that... Um... And highlighted extremely well um, what is required. I, th I think that does. I think it's easier, especially at the beginning, to uh, go a bit over the top, maybe with your deck, and you want to share a lot. You know, you're doing a, you've been doing a lot, a lot of good stuff at the beginning, and you want to share more. But actually, that ability to nail the message is is important, and so maintaining that focus is is great. Um, you know, the timeline that I share about a, the, the different iteration, the couple of weeks that goes from one step to another, I think is, is, is valid. And uh, my suggestion for all the founding teams is also just to keep that in mind, you know, especially at the beginning, you're probably, you're not fully aware how long it's going to take. Just be aware it's going to take weeks, if not months to go from end to end. So uh, consider that in the whole process. It's not going to be just one meeting. There are going to be a number of meetings, a number of conversations that will get you to the final decision and, and, and the, the investment. Nico, uh, anything to add on that one? Yeah, I would say, um, as I said earlier, uh, start with the storytelling. I think that was that's pretty much what Ed is alluding to as well, which is one pager. Um, I would say, I would refer to the crossing the chasm. I think that's an important principle. Please Google it. Uh, so you have to prove in your story that there's traction. 
uh, and potential skill. Um, I would also refer to, to TAM as a total addressable market, which is very important to investors to, 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 to make that part of your story. Um, and as well as uh, that, a story should never be more than 15 slides. Um, and, and, the f and the focus should be on why you're doing this and what you're doing rather than the how. Um, so um, that's kind of my two cents on this. And the time comment, I think, is, is absolutely valid because it's giving that feeling of how big the opportunity will be over time. It's beyond the initial investment, if it's in an early stage, it's what's happening also with BC and beyond. And the time is giving that feeling and it also helps the investor to understand that your analysis and your strategy is it, exhaustive. You've, you've thought about how this company, this business will scale over time and why will be a successful business. Absolutely. Great advice there, guys. Um, before we move on, I'm just going to do a quick reset for those who have joined us uh, while we were already going on. Uh, this is uh, the first uh, in a series of startup spaces uh, brought to you by Circle CI uh, and based on the Building Tech Teams report, uh, which was created in partnership with Sifted. And you can probably see there is a pinned tweet uh, above our heads here, uh, and you can download the report from there. Um, with that said, uh, again, uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. So if you would like to ask a question, you can either raise your hand uh, when we get to that stage, or you can actually send it to us by using uh, sending a tweet with the hashtag uh, CircleCI Spaces. It's in the title of the room as well. So you can just click on that and send us a tweet and we'll read the questions out at the end too. With that said, um, we have also um, we are also recording this session. So if you do come up uh, on the stage to ask a question, uh, you will be agreeing to being recorded. So please bear that in mind as well. Uh, moving on to the next question, uh, this is probably more for Luca and Nico. Um, where do you start with your product strategy? Do you start by the customer or all with the product? Well. Uh, let me take that one. Um, that's the, 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 the easiest question today. That's uh, customer, customer, customer. So um, I think that, by the way, is a big mistake of many founding teams as far as I, I've seen it also out of my mentoring uh, practice. So, of course, you're very focused uh, on your day-to-day -day job on, on the product and how you do this and how you solve these problems. But um, often you forget to take uh, your potential investors on this journey about what's the real true business pain on the table um, and, uh, and and how this is leading to uh, and you have to dra dramatize this uh, what's going to happen to this customer if they're not going to take your problem or your, 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 uh, your product i.e. What's going to happen to them if they're just going to leave this as is? Uh, what What's their disaster scenario? I mean, that's that's where you need to start your story. And then the product part is just one third, kind of midway your uh, your your deck, um, where the last third should be kind of more organizational and uh, and, and 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 financial. So, yes, it's it's about the customer, um, and you need need to start there and you need to end there <laughs> as well. Also, with the ana analysis in terms of the TOM, we discussed this before, had a total uh, addressable market. You have a top-down perspective, which analyzes kind of the overall market and all the parameters and assumptions around that. But also, you need to do a bottom-up perspective about your the customers. Who are those particular customers? Do you know those? Can you access them? And so it, so it, it starts with the customer problem, and it ends with customers as well in, in terms of your whole story to close the loop. At least that's my two cents. Uh, Great perspective there. Luca? Yeah, no, I think that Nico, Nico is right. Uh, the customer is always uh, a very valid starting point, but you know, I'm a technologist, so I need to give a bit, of, a bit of more love to the product side. Uh, and I think that even when you start from customer, you know, that has to go hand in hand in how your product is solving the solution. So, you know, for all the technical 
co-founders that are listening to us. It's not that you, your contribution is not valid. It's that you just have to flip your perspective and understanding. The first is the demand from a customer. is the, 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 the total addressable market, the service addressable market. What's the pain point I'm solving? And what we build as a technology is a solution to, a, to that problem. And uh, uh, the value that you can add, especially at the early stage, is also helping to explain how eventually your solution and your, to the problem through your product, your technology is different. Why is you're solving the problem better than other people? It's definitely, as Nico said, it's not the details of what we're doing. And this is, this is less important, but it's about helping understand this is the problem we identify in the market. We're going to solve it. This is what's going to happen if we don't solve it. This is why I believe our solution is better than some of the competitors. And hey, if you're the first one to identify the problem, even better, sometimes even harder. But then again, this is why the solving this problem is important, is how our product is, is, is helping us to get there. Great. Uh, Ed, anything to add? I know that's no. not exactly your field, but <laughs> perfect. Um, so uh, finally on Series A, how do you make plans to scale and monetize your product once you get to that stage, Nico? Well, uh, it starts always with a 36 months plan. Uh, I think that's what any typical VC would want to see. Uh, and then per month. Um, you, um, you also take the per product or per customer economics, which is about gross margin or the payback period if you have to do an investment per customer, for example, uh, for hardware or whatever business you're in, uh, how, how much time will it take you to, to earn this back? By the way, if this is any, anywhere uh, sh sh worse than kind of six to nine months, then think again, if you want to present this to, uh, to VCs, you probably have to tweak a little uh, your investment model. Um, and then the, th the second thing is about the investment case altogether. That is about all the investments you need to do into the product. Um, maybe some IPR, some intellectual property rights you're gonna you're you're, you're gonna register and, and the investments to go with that. Um, so you, so you need to in, in demonstrate it at economical level for a per customer basis, and you need to uh, at a, a total level prove that this is a viable investment with a uh, a certain return. Um, and again, uh, coming back to the Tom, I've, I've already said, hope you have to hone in um, on all the assumptions you're making and why why you are best positioned or your team is best positioned to know everything about this assumption uh, and, and, and why it is uh, the way you say it is. Uh, you need to really have proof for it. Best is, by the way, to have customers uh, talking about that. So if your customers say, for, for example, you say, uh, well, my assumption is uh, a customer uh, makes an error Y if they implement my product and it goes from X to Y. It is great to have customers say that in your in your deck or, or even on a video, it's even better uh, saying, okay, well, we had this problem, this is a solution and it brought us from X to Y and that's why this company is fantastic and don't take this product away. I love it. So that's kind of uh, how I would go about uh, the planning um, on uh, and, and, and the monetization, by the way. There's a lot of uncertainty typically about monetization. Don't say things you don't know, i.e. come up with options. You, so you say, well, we're testing a, a business model that has a pricing like this and, a, and, a rev, and, and maybe a SaaS service like that. Uh, well, we're not 100% certain. We still need to validate it in the market uh, until we have 100 or 200 or 1,000 customers. We're not going to settle on it. We're going to A-B test it. That is a much better answer than trying to, to kind of bluff your way through things you don't know. Um, of course, a little bit of bluff, by the way, for the salespeople on this call is always good. Uh, and uh, at I'm not sure is uh, is there to uh, to validate that, but uh, but don't don't do don't overdo it, and uh, be transparent about the things uh, you're um, you don't know yet or the market doesn't know yet at this uh, moment. That's it. Perfect. Thank you very much, Nico. Uh, Luca, anything to add on this particular point? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask maybe a, a, a point from a product technology perspective on um, 
plans to scale. And you know, the more you scale, the more your uh, some of your cost base will go up. And in technologies, it's mostly two things like people and uh, in, in cloud infrastructure. And this is the latter is naturally will naturally go up. And it's a good thing because if your if your cost if your cloud infrastructure are going up because you're serving more customer or different markets or uh, you're building new products, it, it's a healthy growth. But one of the things you probably want to start be aware of and consider is the relationship between your cloud infrastructure cost and any additional cost that you might consider on data acquisition or even people to your ability to your return of investment from a, a user level. And from a, a, a technology perspective, from a, for, as a CTO, start connecting those dots and explaining that uh, the growth that you expect in your, in, for scale to support the uh, extend the customer base is actually healthy because it's driven this growth or like the cost of acquisition per customer is X rather than Y. It start to be important. And the sooner you start from a, 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 from a CTO perspective of, of having that awareness, the easier is for you to, to, to frame it effectively in internally in the business while you say, well, we're going to spend more and this is why we're going to spend more rather than say just when you have the bill at the end of the month. Or, but even externally, when you talk with a potential investor to explain that you expect a growth in your cost, but these are the reasons why and this is why it's a, it's, it's a healthy additional investment. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, I think we're gonna move on to the next question just because I'm conscious of the fact that we're getting close to the time. It flies when we're having fun. Uh, so, and I want to leave some time for questions at the end. Um, so next, um, it's how do you prep for success at a larger scale and what metrics should your team be focusing on? Um, Luca, let's start with you on this one. So I think that from a product technology perspective, definitely uh, you need to start more and more connecting your uh, uh, the metrics of your product uh, to the, 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 the high level metric that we discussed before about uh, your ARR, your monthly active users, so that you can demonstrate there's a strong connection between the, the business metrics that often you're going to talk with investors, with the board and the future investors to, to, to what you're doing. I, I'm a big believer that uh, the more you're able to connect, even for uh, all the technology teams, uh, what they do to those metrics, the easier it is for everyone to work in the same direction. Um, there is a uh, there are certain numbers and metrics of of, of, of if, let's call it efficiency that have become important as connected to what we discussing before. You know, if if you have a significant uh, cloud infrastructure, how do I have control? It is not about limit your investment, but I have control of your investment. Um, and preparation for success at a larger scale, I think it's all about the strategy. You're a bigger business. You're trying to tackle bigger problems. Uh, you might not have the same agility that you used to have. You know, you're moving from being five people around the table to 100, uh, 150, or you name it, how many people in the business. So you're a bit slower on, on turning also because you already have a larger customer base. So have a clear strategy of what is important for you and, and how to get there is becoming successful at the larger scale because without that, it's very hard to put in place all the activities, the process, the decision that you need to do, that will allow to get to that scale. And some of these have a long lead time. You know, scaling product technology teams is not something that happens overnight. Uh, you need to have a lead time. So that from the time you decide how to get to the scale and the number, you need to get yourself the time. So the strategy is the way to prepare for the larger scale, in my opinion. Thank you, Luca. Ed, from a VC perspective, an investor perspective, are there any particular metrics that you would be interested in? I mean, we obviously love the sort of financial sort of related um, metrics. So, um, I mean, you know, ARR and growth and gross margin, and all those sorts of things. Um, I think anything that is a lead indicator on those is also um, very valuable. And I think, um, you know, as companies get bigger, you can do, you can be a lot more precise on that. So you can start measuring sort of top of funnel activity, you know, sort of MQLs created, conversion, um, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but the other, um, you know, for sure, I think usage uh, and engagement is is anything that brings that to life is really uh, is really key. Because, you know, other, I mean, even at sort of Series B and Series C stages, you're still, um, you know, companies are big for us in the early stage. Well, they're pretty small still 
on the on the world stage and and you're really still trying to get comfort that this is a world beater um as a as a value proposition as a business around it and anything that brings to life that sort of customer love customer adoption user engagement you know like how many people actually are, you know engaging with the good or the service um how regularly how how often they come back um you know what's the dwell time anyway and uh, very different also for consumer businesses to B2B businesses, but anything that just brings to life that customer engagement, as well as all the trading metrics, I think are helpful. Nico, I saw you unmuted. I'm sure you have something to add. No, I think uh, uh, eloquently uh, explained this. And uh, I, I would say, yeah, the engagement part is um, a key thing, especially if you're, kind of later stage, uh, a, for example, retention ratios or churn ratios and why, why this is happening. Um, and then kind of uh, land and expand kind of strategies for, okay, your customer was using X and now they're using X plus 20 in terms of either revenue or usage. Why is this the case? And why, why is this proving uh, the longer term growth of your business? That That's typically... At scaling your company uh, uh, the moment to, to get these kind of uh, statistics and, uh, and metrics. By the way, at this stage, it's all about metrics. It's metrics, metrics, and metrics. Um, and because you've already done Series A by now, uh, you've had milestones, you've either made them or you didn't. So you need to explain that, but that's all metrics, metrics based. One last question before we open up to the audience questions. Uh, how do you handle user feedback and iterate on that? Obviously, that's more for the founders. So, Luca. Yeah, I think that uh, this is the only difference from previous stages is that, as I said before, you're probably a slightly more complex organization. So you're going to be slightly slower. Um, and also you have a larger customer base. So you're going to have even more feedback. Uh, the way to to look at that is getting the feedback, overlay with your long-term strategy, understand if the feedback is coming from the, the, you know, the, the segment that you're really targeting and you want to grow, and then you decide how to respond to that feedback. And the more you're, uh, you grow, the, the larger you are, the more you want to be able to do the analysis over a, a number of feedback, right? You know, Because every single customer has a slightly different perspective and there's a, a very interesting product work there to extract what's the real feedback that you're seeing across a number of, of, of customers that, uh, that are sharing the elements. Um, then you just inject it in your, in your cycle. I think that uh, the part that's getting, uh, has to become more sophisticated over time from your product and organization is, again, the ability to connect that feedback to those high-level metrics that have been discussing quite a lot over the last 10 minutes. I think we're all in in, in, in strong agreement that, you know, the, the bigger you are, it's all about metrics. So the feedback, the customer is asking this feature, one this innovation or that iteration, that may kind of make sense, but how this is going to help me increase my retention, how that's going to help me grow my ARR or my, uh, my customer acquisition, because this is, again, is going to feedback to your, feedback to your strategy and will help the organization to align behind that decision to eventually execute on the feedback and build something new or different, or actually park it for the time being and eventually assess in three, six, nine months. Absolutely. Prioritization becomes uh, much more important at this stage, right? Uh, yes, that is a good and a bad thing in a way, but definitely uh, being able to look at that and put them in the bigger picture is the way to consider feedback uh, past the early stage. Great. Thank you, Luca. Uh, Nico? Yeah, the, the interesting thing about this is it's a total empty pattern because what you see is, for example, if you go Series B, uh, founders and, 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 and previous key management was always very involved in Series A in early stage in, in customer projects and, and they have the relationships themselves. What you see in Series B, this, this organization is starting to scale. There's now 100 plus people or maybe even 500 plus people uh, and getting the customer feedback, although you have many more of them is actually becoming much harder, which is strange. Um, so from a management perspective, from a CTO, CEO, or a CPO as a, as a product officer, you need, really need to make an effort on structuring uh, the customer feedback, which is 
of course, success metrics like MPS. Yeah, um, um, monitor. I mean, any investment in MPS, uh, net promoter score kind of uh, information, and, uh, and and the free format feedback you can get from customers is well uh, spent money uh, for any any dollar you would invest in it. Of course, you can also do it in a in a in a, in a kind of easier fashion in terms of installing a, a user group for your product. And uh, basically, putting customers together in at a nice location, have them talk about your product. At least, if they have any level of engagement with you or with your product, um, I think uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much what it is. Yeah. And, and Nico, this is this is very valid because what you're what you're doing between the, that Series A and C to to the BSC that you're moving you you move beyond your early adopters, right? They have that passion and that drive to 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 use your product, even might be sometime incomplete or not as as complete as a feature set to the others. So sure. this is exactly what you need to work uh, within the, your organization. Having everyone involved, what are the levers I have to get people to give me feedback? Is it the NPS? It's like having like a customer, you know, advisory board. Is other mechanisms to get those information because you're right. There's a big risk at a certain point that the customer becomes a little too passive, maybe because the product is great and they have nothing to say. But without the feedback loop, you're missing an important element in your prioritization. Check. Great. There you go. Uh, we are in agreement on that one. Um, I think we uh, would like to open uh, for audience questions as we have already a couple coming in uh, before we end as I'm conscious of uh, our hard stop at 1 p.m. UK time. Uh, so if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand and we'll bring you up on stage. Um, while we wait for that to happen, um, I have a question that was sent. Uh, there you go. We have someone uh, asking a question. I'm just bringing them up on stage. Um, in a second, uh, Phil, your mic will be open if you accept and you'll be able to ask your question. So let's wait for that to happen. And while uh, Phil comes up to ask his question, I have a question. Ah, there you go. He's connecting now. Go ahead, Phil. Hello, everyone. Um, awesome, awesome chat. Um, really enjoyed all of it. Uh, the one question I had was, it was actually kind of a call back to something earlier. I think Ed said about, um, I was interested by the, um, the, the comment you made about things changing and how like six months ago, it would have been a different answer in, and just the sort of like the scale of, of investments going up. Um, we read about this a lot, but it's really interesting to hear that sort of firsthand. Um, two part question, if you don't mind, but the first is, is there a particular stage where that is dramatically happening? For example, is, is seed sort of like chugging along like normal, but it's when you get to series A or B that that's where they're kind of like the rapidly expanding um, change is happening or is it just across the board? So that's the kind of first half. And then secondly, is there anything that startups are being expected to do differently to to make that possible or is it more just that is that a symbol of the economic and vc kind of competitive environment that's that's driving that uh so for, for what i can see um i would say it's mainly at the early stage and later stage and in the in between so around sort of series b series c i mean it's still competitive but it's not the same intensity so i um i mean interesting what others others think if they agree but i'd say um, I mean, we're seeing some, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and the later stage, I mean, you know, we're seeing like $150 million, $200 million financing rounds done, start to finish in like three weeks, which is just insane. Um, and I think that, you know, the cause of that are, um, you know, sort of largely led by, you know, the weight of capital coming in, um, you know, everything from the SPACs uh, and the hedge funds, you know, moving in. Um, and then just because there's more money in the system, there are lots more um, entrepreneurs who have, you know, been involved in the first or second wave of tech startups who've got some money who are now, you know, active angels, you've got seed funds, you know, sort of beginning to emerge as well. So it um, is a very, very busy, thriving kind of seed system. And I think in most, most European markets. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing, I think in terms of what startups have to do, I don't think anything has changed, but maybe one thing to 
sort of caution against that comment. There's this, you know, perhaps this impression there's so much money out there that, you know, maybe um, maybe it's so easy to raise money. I, I think we still live a little bit in the world of the haves and the have nots. Um, and so what we're kind of seeing is that companies that are kind of obviously great companies, it is so intense to invest in them. Uh, and the, and the, the sort of um, the power dynamic is definitely, you know, founders get to choose which of the many offers, um, you know, they would like to take. And, and I'm very much in sell mode. But the other companies are often being funded at all. And it's sort of what is quite binary. Um, and that um, and I think that's a whole bunch of reasons behind that. Um, so I'm not sure that startups need to change. They're just uh, I think the ones that are promising are, are getting funded very, very quickly. Uh, Luca and Nico, anything to add to this? Not from me. Yeah, not really, but just just one one perspective. What what I've seen, say say ten years ago, in terms of having a great business idea, uh, not having a ton of experience, not having a senior team to back it, you might have been getting funded fairly easily. These days, also, many VCs have been burning their hands with junior teams. So I think if there's anything more important, it's about the track record of the key members in, in the team or the founders. So I think of the last 10, 15 years, and maybe, Ed, you can shed some light on that as well. I think it's been gaining to importance. That also means that, especially in the early stages, it's about team, team, and TAM. Yeah? So it's it's twice about team, and it's one about what's the opportunity at hand, uh, rather than anything else. So that's my perspective. Thank you very much, everyone. And one final question that was asked using the hashtag. Um, do you have any advice for a more introverted or less charismatic founder who might struggle to tell their story and connect with VCs? Uh, Ed, uh, if you could take this one and then we'll go to Nico. So um, that's a very interesting question. I, I think it depends on the stage um, of the company um, because, I mean, coming back to the team point and the experience, you know, which I completely agree with, um, Nico, and your observations there, um, you know, we're looking to back leaders, um, you know, people who can lead a company, not just through those early stages, but, you know, throughout the whole life cycle of, of the company. Um, now, the I guess if it's a very early stage company, it's very technical product. And there's, you sometimes have, I guess, um, you know, you can have some technical founders and then you might find as the company uh, moves along that actually that person isn't the CEO, but they may become a chief product officer or, some, have some other role um but that's probably the only time i think you can sort of get away with not being that good at telling the story um so uh i think if you are otherwise introverted uh, but you want to be the leader you want to be the ceo you want to skill you know grow and scale a great company i think you need to kind of learn learn the stuff learn you know kind of learn storytelling and it can be a lot of this stuff can be learned yeah i was going to say that these things can be learned um, so for people that are more on the introvert side, don't feel beaten up. You can get to the right level of confidence and um, ability to have an excellent communication and show your leadership in a different way and, and still drive the, the growth of the company. Nico, final word? Yeah. Uh, uh, I think about 50% of it can be learned. Yes. Uh, so go to a uh, kind of a, a tech star type of school to, to get your pitch right and, and to be able to script everything and rehearsal, rehearsal, rehearsal before you actually go to prime time to your favorite VC that you really want to land. Um, that's for sure one thing. And the other part is also be open about what you're not good at. So it's very strong if you sit in a VC meeting and say, I am not the best communicator in the world, but hey, I'm actually the best product person in the world because of reason X, Y, Z. And you know what? If you fund me, I'm going to make sure I'm going to hire someone who's going to run this 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 uh, this company for me and he's, who's going to be a te uh, the team lead. Uh, it's very, very strong if you know your own weaknesses and you don't leave it to Ed <laughs> to conclude this on your behalf between quotes. 
Ed, anything well, I completely to add? agree with that. Yeah. Self awareness and Perfect. humility are very, very compelling. Great. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that we are at one o'clock and uh, people are busy and have to go back to their busy days. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers, Ed, Luca and Nico, for sharing their expertise and their knowledge with us. And also, of course, to everyone in the audience who uh, listened to us uh, talking a bit about this. Uh, we will, as mentioned before, be recording the session. So uh, it will be uh, available later uh, as a podcast. So keep an eye out for that. And we will obviously share the link in the Circle CI Twitter feed. So follow the Circle CI account uh, to get all the updates on this. With that, again, thank you very much to our wonderful speakers. And thank you to the audience for listening in. Uh, have a lovely day and catch up with you later. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. Cheers.